Silent Hill 3, a game not even originally planned to be a direct sequel, would continue on the franchise and become one of the series' best. It extrapolates on the previous game's successes and tries to tweak them. This entry would also continue the story from the first game, building upon the world and lore created there. Can this game live up to the genius of Silent Hill 2, though? Did it even need to? Today, we're going to be taking a comprehensive look at Silent Hill 3. We'll be talking about gameplay, story, mechanics, and everything in between. If you haven't seen my other two videos on Silent Hill, now would probably be a good time to watch them. I'll be talking a lot about the first Silent Hill here, so that context is going to be necessary. Spoiler alert for Silent Hill 1, 2, and 3. Hey Dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I want to talk about Silent Hill 3. Team Silent returned to make the third game in the series, and development began after the release of Silent Hill 2 in September of 2001. The game was originally supposed to be a rail shooter, and possibly an arcade game, according to Masahiro Ito. It also was not going to be a direct sequel to the series. This whole portion of development wasted time and a large amount of the team's budget. Masahiro Ito did not return to do full creature design on this game, designing only about half of them and supervising the rest. This role would be taken over by Jun Inoue. Kazuhide Nakazawa, the character animator for Silent Hill 2, would return to the third game as director. Hiroyuki Owaku returned to write the script for Silent Hill 3. Owaku said that Silent Hill 2 was about using the silence in individuals, and as that silence built into anxiety, it blossomed into fear. But Silent Hill 3 is about creating a more violent and direct feeling of fear, which, in contrast to the previous game, is shocking. This wasn't just Owaku's outlook either. This seemed to be a team-wide thesis for the game moving forward. Shingo Yuri, the character designer, said Heather, the main character of the game, was based on women like Charlotte Gainsborough and Sophie Marceau. Claudia was made to look strange but conventional. She was originally designed to be bald and have tattoos all over her body, but the designers wanted to keep her malevolence hidden. The male characters also were designed to look realistic with failings and flaws. Vincent was made to look untrustworthy. When he laughs, he looks like he's hiding something, and he's never looking directly at who he's talking to. Akira Yamaoka returned as sound designer and also producer this time around. He decided to implement vocals into some of the songs for the first time in the series after hearing an angelic muse on a TV special about voodoo. Ito seemed to also be focusing more on horror with his creature design here, evoking images of hell and the creatures that inhabit or guard it. In general, they wanted the world to be more hostile, violent, and full of doubt. As we'll see shortly, this really comes through in the game and was one of the first things that I noticed. Silent Hill 3 was released on May 23, 2003 for the PlayStation 2. I played Silent Hill 3 on PC, as I did the previous entries, though no enhanced edition this time around. This was pretty convenient and doesn't bear much difference between the console versions, minus a couple audio files which I'll talk about later. The PC port on its own is pretty buggy though and requires a few fan patches and fixes to get it working properly. It doesn't take long to prove what I was saying about the amped up horror in the game, because it begins with one of the most terrifying introductions I've ever seen. Its sounds are foreign, ripping through the speakers, and its imagery is incredibly vile, unnerving. It makes you cringe when you see it. There's a little cutscene that plays whenever you don't press any buttons on the main screen, and whenever I was trying to get recording set up, this would play through my speakers. This sound just sets me off in a visceral, biological way. 
I can't exactly tell why it upsets me, but it does, and just about everything in this game is like that. The game begins in the Silent Hill Amusement Park, and it doesn't take its time getting into the thick of it. We're playing as our new main character, Heather. She's already equipped with weapons, a gun, and a steel pipe. She's surrounded by bloody rabbit animatronics, and she heads into the park with a knife. As we enter this first door, we are assaulted by this game's violent sound design. This proves exactly what I was saying before in the team's thesis. The previous game was all about using silence properly, and Silent Hill 3 is the antithesis of that. If Silent Hill 2 was tricking you from afar, subtly leading you into different things and maybe catching your foot in a bear trap, then Silent Hill 3 is physically assaulting you with a weapon. There's constantly sounds pumping, pistons cranking, the screeches of demon dogs and the howls of something terrible in the background. This start for the game is also the opposite of Silent Hill 2. It doesn't slowly introduce you to the creatures of the world to subtly creep you out over the course of the beginning of the game. It thrusts you directly into its world to show you just what you're up against and how terrifying and horrific it can be. We can make it through the amusement park section here if we want. If we die at any point, then we realize this is just a dream sequence and wake up from the nightmare. But we can actually make it all the way to the roller coaster tracks, where Heather still ends up getting hit by a cart and waking up from her dream anyways. Heather was sleeping in a mall store called Happy Burger. She heads outside and calls her father on the payphone and tells him she's about to head home. <laughs> Dad. Sorry I didn't call sooner. Her father is Harry Mason from the first game, and Heather is the child that Harry was given by Alessa. A man suddenly approaches and says he's a detective. This is Douglas Cartland, and Heather doesn't want to talk to him. Hold on. There's someone that wants to meet you. Just let me have an hour. No half an hour of your time. My daddy always told me not to talk to strangers. This is very important. It's about your birth. He follows her up to the bathroom and she uses the window inside to escape. We can hear End of Small Sanctuary playing in the background, a new song for the game. I played it at the beginning of this video and it's one of my favorites in the series. It's repeating guitar riffs and steady beat evoke a feeling of melancholy. It's a little upbeat, but the reverb gives it an almost dreamlike quality, matching the game. But it also doesn't match the ripping, violent horror that the game does. But it has this implied horror behind it. There's an undertone here that something will happen in the future. It feels like being happy on a Sunday evening, but in the back of your mind, you know you have to go to work in the morning. Heather notices a strange symbol on the mirror that makes her head hurt when she looks at it. This is our new save system. These symbols scrawled all over the world will allow us to save our progress. I like this little incorporation and it makes saving actually feel like an in-world event. It takes what Silent Hill 2 did with its red square save points and pushes it the rest of the way. Heather hops out of the window and heads back into the shopping center. Making our way through the dirt-marked hallways of the mall, Heather finds an open store and heads inside. We find a handgun here on the floor, along with our first enemy. These are the Closers, a horrifying thing with lips for a face, a tall figure with long, bulbous arms that are stitched and bandaged together. It's terrifying and totally matches the tone that this game is going for. 
A lot of enemies in this game, along with the bosses, are large. They tower over us in their height, indicative of not only their oddity in this world, but their power. This huge monster set against the small and nimble heather makes for a terrifying dynamic. We kill the thing and head out into the shopping center proper. Heather finds a key stuck under some pallets. We need something to pick it up with, which is where some tongs, hidden away in another part of the mall, come in useful. This lets us into a bookstore where we have to place Shakespeare anthologies in order to unlock a door. We have to match the carved numbers on the spines to create a sequence, which will give us the code we need. On the hard difficulty, some knowledge of Shakespeare is actually required. There's a long memo with references to different plays, and you have to match them with the descriptions in the anthologies. Through this door, we meet a new character, Claudia. She tells Heather that the monsters in the shopping center have come to witness the rebirth of paradise. What are you talking about? Don't you know? Your power is needed. How should I know? I am Claudia. So what? Remember me, and your true self as well. Also, that which you must become. Claudia finally tells Heather that she wasn't the one who brought the monsters. It was God. Heather gets a pain in her head as Claudia walks away, and she's confused. Heather heads into an elevator and gets a radio. This serves the same functionality as in the previous games. We get an increasing static as we get closer to enemies. The radio really wasn't as prominent in this game as the previous two, I felt. It was definitely scarier in the Silent Hill streets of the town before. The first half of this game doesn't take place there. It's one of the few in the series that has areas outside of Silent Hill. On top of that, everything else has been taken up to 11, so the radio static is really just a background element. Heather boards another elevator and we see some terrifying monsters. A lot of Silent Hill has been inspired by the film Jacob's Ladder, and we've talked about that before. But this is the game where you can see that terror come through fully. Not even a kid could believe in this. But when am I going to back up? The monster's head shake effects and heavy grating is in full force here. We're in the alternate version of the shopping center now. We encounter a new enemy, the Doublehead. These dogs evoke, as Ito stated before, the hellish hounds that guard the underworld. They are wrapped in bandages and their heads are split down the center vertically, their tongues hanging from their mouth. Heading through the shopping center, this place is full to the brim with closers, double heads, and other things taking off after us. The bathroom from earlier has a closed stall that opens as we leave. Inside is a blood-covered toilet. This is based on the Japanese horror stories surrounded being sucked into a toilet, possibly specific ones like the yokai Hanako-san. Heather grabs a bulletproof vest in one of the shops. This can actually be equipped and will reduce the amount of damage that we take, but will make us much slower in turn. I never really used it because it seemed like the trade-off wasn't really worth it. We also grab a hanger down here, which lets Heather reach a ladder in the game, pulling it down and allowing us access to the second floor. Upstairs, we find a TV that's playing the same footage that we saw in the first game inside the town center, the footage of Cheryl calling to Harry. We find a walnut inside of one of the stores and a vice. We can use this to crack the nut and give us a moonstone. This moonstone will allow us to access one of the marked doors in the building. A lot of Silent Hill 3's gameplay choices are kind of odd. These mini-puzzles of having to find objects and use them in different areas are nothing new, but Silent Hill 3 doesn't feel like it had a ton of the logic that the previous two games did. A lot of the objectives seem pretty random and don't feel like they have a ton of basis. 
I don't think it necessarily affects the game a ton, it's just a small nitpick and a slight difference from the previous games. We get a steel pipe as well from one of the restaurants in the mall. This is a slight upgrade from our knife that we started with and is pretty useful as a melee weapon. Heather finds a corridor that's blocked by tons of flying bugs. There's a trash can and a fan here. Turning the fan off and mixing some bleach and detergent that we found in the shopping mall will create a bug killer. Turning the fan back on will disperse the agent throughout the hall and clear our path forward. Eventually, we reach a ladder on the third floor that follows all the way to the first. As Heather arrives at the bottom, the ladder breaks, and we realize that we're in the arena of our first boss fight. A massive worm-like creature pops out from one of the holes in the wall, and we're ready to battle the split worm. The fight is pretty simple. We have to shoot its mouth resembling our first boss battle from Silent Hill 1. We move back and forth here and avoid the worm as it pokes its head out, and shoot it as much as we can. I'll be honest, I didn't really love the design of this boss. It felt a little more like something from Resident Evil rather than Silent Hill. It feels pretty out of place against some of the other bosses in the series. When it's killed, the game fades to white and we're back in the normal shopping center. Heather heads out and meets Douglas again. It's you. What just happened? You must be one of them. What did I do? What do you mean by one of them? You're in on this with that Claudia, aren't you? He seemed to have experienced the same things we did, but Heather thinks he must be helping Claudia. Douglas says that Claudia asked him to find Heather, but that he doesn't take sides. Heather doesn't know what's going on. Look, I was just hired to find you. I'm not on anybody's side. I don't know anything about this. Why don't you start by telling me what happened to you? Douglas asks what's so special about Heather in the first place. But I know there's something. Something I've been running from and forgot for a long time. Heather says she has to face something she's forgotten for a long time, but doesn't know what she's remembering. It seems like her memories are being taken over, or something. She heads into the subway to try and get home. Heading inside, we find a memo about a man who threw himself onto the train tracks and was decapitated. We head deeper into the train station, trying to get access home. Heather finds a nutcracker and uses it to break the bolt on a locked gate. Eventually, we find some out-of-use trains, and one of them holds a shotgun, our newest weapon. I saved the shotgun for the late game because, towards the end, the enemies can get pretty bulky and difficult. It's probably best used there. Heather hops down onto the train tracks to unlock a door and barely escapes the oncoming train. When it arrives, a door at the other end opens, and we finally have a way home. Doubleheads are chasing us down the long, dark corridors, and it's an incredibly tense moment trying to get to the train. When we enter the car, the door shuts and we're forced to head wherever this thing is going. If we step out the back door, we can see we're on the last car. Moving through into the next car and trying to head back reveals that as we enter the next, the car behind us is falling off. We fight a few numb bodies in here, creatures that are bipedal tadpoles almost with veins and purplish skin. Heading through to the final car, the train will halt to a stop and we find out there was no one controlling it the whole time. Outside, we're now in the underpass, a sewer-like level of the game. 
I like the way this section of the game flows. It goes through multiple areas without staying too long. We're weaving through buildings and trying to find our way home across the city. It has the disadvantage of not being able to get to know one area for too long, but it also keeps the surroundings fresh and changing, which is scary in and of itself. The underpass alone is terrifying. Claustrophobic hallways filled to the brim with monsters, dark and cavernous tunnels, blood-spattered rooms. This is the atmosphere that we're used to, a place that feels like we need to get out and we need to run. It evokes the same feeling that the sewers did in the first game, and it isn't the last comparison we'll be making to Silent Hill here. We find a mall in one of the workers' locker rooms, an upgrade for our melee weapons, kind of. It deals more damage than the steel pipe, but is a bit unwieldy. Its swing time is long, and it goes out in a huge arc. Making our way through the interweaving hallways, we can fill a wine bottle we've picked up with some oil. This can then be used to start one of the machines in the next room and get us further down the underpass. Two newish enemies are much more common here. We've seen them both before in the amusement park dream sequence and a couple times throughout the game, but they both become common. The first is the Insane Cancer. These are massive, hulking brutes resembling a fleshy, cancerous mass. If I can be honest, I didn't fight a single one of these in my original playthrough, because they spooked me to no end. I just ran past them at every opportunity. The other monster, the Pendulums, are equally frightening and annoying. They make a horrific nails-on-a-chalkboard sound, causing you to want to stay out of their way for as long as possible. A hellish amalgamation of torsos with bladed legs floating through the air. They spin attack and rush at you constantly, and can be a real pain to actually fight. Once we're down the ladder, we can actually see something hiding in the water as we pass over a bridge. Heather finds a hairdryer in one of the rooms, and a memo saying that there's a monster in the water that's killed some of the workers. In the next room, we can cross the bridge ahead, but doing so without first assessing the situation, we'll see Heather being pulled into the water by a tentacle monster. We have to plug the dryer in here and throw it in the water, shocking the monster and rendering it useless. Climbing some stairs and ladders will eventually lead us outside into the construction site. If there's one problem with Silent Hill 3, it's the lack of story in the first half. There are long stretches of the game where it feels like we aren't really finding much out. Eventually, the information will come at us in a huge tidal wave, and this game builds on the world the most out of the three but it doesn't really do so until the second half of the game. Heather heads into the construction site, and we can actually find a secret here. Using the maul on a piece of the hidden wall, we'll break it, revealing a silencer that we can use. There also seems to be a body inside the wall. This is a reference to Metal Gear Solid, another game made by Konami. Those games are pretty good, huh? But we can't talk about that just yet, Dad. Heather pushes a mattress down to the next floor and jumps through a hole. We head outside and use some scaffolding to gain access into the next building. We're now in the Hilltop Center, which seems to be a building for office spaces. We find a mannequin who is suspiciously decapitated after we look at it. There's an art museum of sorts inside the building, and one of the paintings is missing. The title card underneath says, Fire Purifies All. We use a screwdriver to open a drawer and get some rope, which, when combined with the car jack, will pry the elevator door open and let us rappel down. Heather finds a bathtub behind some display rooms and turns the faucet on, but nothing comes out. Soon after, the tub starts oozing blood from the drain, and Heather watches the world around her change as her head aches with pain. Invaded by the other world, by a world of someone's nightmarish delusions come to life. She faints and we hear a quote from the first game. 
Harry talking about the other world as we are transported into the other world hilltop center. This is where things change from atmospheric to hellish pretty quickly. We're not really dealing with creepy sounds in the other room, we're dealing with that steel grating again, barbed wire, creatures holding babies. This is what Silent Hill 3 excels at, the in-your-face terror and horror. A new enemy is introduced here, the Slurper. They almost resemble anteaters with their long snouts. They crawl on the ground and will rip at Heather's legs if they're allowed to get too close. We enter the library and finally find another person among this hellscape. That's what you're called now, isn't it? And who are you? The name's Vincent. Don't forget it, okay? I'm on your side. Vincent says Claudia was brainwashed by Heather's mother. My mother? What do you mean? You don't remember? Uh, so Harry didn't tell you anything. I guess he hid the truth to keep you on his side, eh? That figures. He's a pretty sneaky guy. Don't talk about my dad like that! Vincent seems to know everything, which is how he knows about Heather's past and Harry. Heather is upset about being in the other world, but Vincent seems to enjoy it. Wait! I'm not finished talking! I knew you were on her side. How do you figure? There's something wrong with you too. This game is a return to the characters of the first Silent Hill. Everyone is incredibly shifty, we're not sure what goals and motives they have, and contrary to Silent Hill 2, there are sides. We're not sure what everyone is after, and Vincent is no exception. He's odd, and he speaks and moves like he's trying to trick us. Heather is clearly off-put by this, and she's just as confused as we are, putting us again in the shoes of a blind protagonist. At this point, she just really wants to get home, back to her father, and away from the other world. We obtain a katana from one of the storerooms in the hilltop center and head down the elevator. The katana is easily the best melee weapon in the base game and is incredibly useful. It's quick and does a decent amount of damage. I used it from here on out as my main melee weapon. Here, there's a giant monster blocking the exit. There's a fairy tale on the ground mirroring the foreshadowing showcased in the first boss fight of Silent Hill. This is much less of a boss fight though and more of a puzzle. We have to work our way around the center and find the missing pages of the fairy tale to figure out how to get this thing out of our way. Back in the art gallery, the missing painting is no longer missing. It shows a godly woman figure surrounded by the glow of white light. The flame purifies all bit is true, and we must use the garbage can under the painting to light it on fire. This reveals a door that we can climb through. Heather remarks that she feels like she's seen the picture before, and we head inside. There's some strange pictures as well on the other side, and Heather finds another piece of the fairy tale. The story goes that a ferocious beast was blocking the castle exit. Nothing would harm it, not bullets or swords. One day, a priestess challenged the beast and eventually dealt her a killing blow. The last piece of the fairy tale is missing. We find a vending machine inside the other world, placing a silver coin inside will give us a can with a key. Using this key to enter the life insurance agency will give us the final piece of the tale. The priestess was killed but came back, and she chanted the words of one single spell, which banished the creature. Two fui ego eres. Weird writing. <gasps> what was that? Heading back to the main chamber, the monster is gone and our way out is clear. This gives us access right back to the apartments. Heather is finally home and hopefully she can leave this all behind her, but probably not. Dad, I'm home. 
Listen, something really crazy is going on. I think we should... Dad? Dad? As she steps inside the apartment, calling for her father, he doesn't respond. She finds his body on the recliner. Harry Mason has been killed, and a trail of blood leads up to the roof. Claudia is at the other end of it, and she says she's killed Harry to get revenge for the events of the first game, stopping the ritual. And then he took you away from us. I'll get you for this! is another reason to fill your heart with hatred. It must be this way. One day you'll understand why. No, I'll never understand! You must try to remember me and your true self as well. You will birth a god and build an eternal paradise. She tells Heather that this monster behind her killed Harry, and she just gave the order. She leaves us to battle the boss and says she'll be waiting in Silent Hill. This boss is the missionary. He's a tall humanoid with a brown sack over his head and a noose around his neck. He'll try to use his bladed arms to slash at us. This boss fight is much better than the first. The enemy design is improved, and it's actually pretty mechanically interesting, for Silent Hill at least. We can't shoot at him from the front or he'll block the bullets. We have to get at him from the sides and when he's down, we can unload lead into him. Okay, so not that mechanically interesting, but a bit better than pacing back and forth across the room. When Heather goes back into the apartment, Douglas is inside. I don't know what to say. Then don't say anything. I'm fine, so just get out of here and leave me alone already! He helps Heather wrap up Harry's body, but they can't give him a burial. Heather says she's going to Silent Hill, and Douglas offers to drive. At this point in the story, Heather is confused, getting faint memories from a life she felt she hasn't lived. Her head is being played with, and she's probably a pawn in a bigger scheme. A mason to the T. But she also wants revenge. She can't let her father's death go unpunished. She wants to kill Claudia herself. Heather heads out of the apartment building, and Douglas says that he just met Vincent. Vincent? He's a friend of yours, right? Well, I'm not sure. He said when we get to Silent Hill to look for a guy named Leonard, and he gave me this map. What do you want to do? We can't trust him, but we've got no other choice. Douglas also gives Heather Harry's journal. On the way to Silent Hill, Heather recounts the events of the first game, the events also retold in Harry's journal. You've been there? Once, on a missing persons case. Never did find him. But I'll tell you, that's one screwed up town. My line of work, you hear a lot of nasty rumors. She laments the fact that she never got to say goodbye to Harry and how happy he made her. Harry raised Heather all these years, and we'll find out through the journal that he was quite conflicted in doing so. At first, he was tentative, because he wasn't sure what power Heather had inside her, and she also reminded him of the nightmare itself. Douglas heads out to track down Leonard, and Heather is heading to the hospital. We're officially back in Silent Hill, and it's pretty much the same as Silent Hill 2, with generally the same map. Brookhaven Hospital looks mostly the same upon entering as well, but we take a different path through the building than James did. Also, 
things are about to get a whole lot different when we shift to the other world. We find a journal inside one of the offices that has a strange doll beside it. A man has written a love letter to Heather. His name is Stanley Coleman, and he's been waiting for her. He made the doll for her when she arrived at the hospital. We find some patient documents that are probably talking about the man that's writing letters to Heather and another man named Leonard, the one we are looking for. We find a room with another letter from Stanley. He says the organization has him shut up in the hospital and he stuck a key to the wall. We get some paint thinner from the nurse's office and it removes the glue, allowing us to take the key. We find another note from Stanley that tells us one of the doctors has changed the passcode to the door. A riddle on the wall will get us the code. We have to do some backwards thinking to rule out numbers and figure out which are which. Silent Hill 3 also doesn't have a ton of puzzles. This is really only our second real puzzle of the game. They're sparsed out a lot more, and I felt like this was a bit of a downgrade from the previous entries. The puzzles always felt like a bit of a breather, and maybe that's the reason that they pared them down for this entry. They didn't want to give you breathers, they wanted you to keep going and feel pressured and isolated. No breaks. Heather finds a dead man with a tattoo in the morgue. It says, the start time is my key. We find a doctor's record that sends us to the second floor. Here, there's an alarm going off and the clock is set to a certain time, which, with the knowledge of the previous tattoo, will be our key. Stanley has left us another letter declaring his love for Heather, and opening the briefcase nets us an instant camera. We can use this to look behind the shelves in a storage room and get the code for another door. Here, we find a magazine on one of the beds. A reporter seems to have done a piece on Silent Hill's strange religion. He notes that a witness said he hears children crying at night from the wish house. We find a final journal of Stanley's telling Heather goodbye and saying that Leonard despises him. The doll beside it is ripped to pieces. Heather finds a ringing phone and the man on the other end thinks Heather is Claudia. Hello? Claudia. No, I'm not- Don't lie to me, Claudia. You're always trying to run from your responsibilities. Have you come to apologize? Or maybe you still don't realize how foolish you've been. The salvation of all mankind. Ah, what a ridiculous dream. Wait, just listen to me for a second. I've heard enough from you already. This is Claudia's father, Leonard. Eventually, he realizes it's Heather on the other end. Heather, will you help me? Help you? I'm locked up in here, and I must stop Claudia. Where are you now? I'm not sure myself. But the door is at the end of the hall on the second floor. I think I can be of help to you. I have a seal. Please. Heather heads down to the second floor and a door with an M on it has appeared at the end of the hall. Inside is a long, weaving hallway, a labyrinth of appearing and disappearing gates. At the end, we find what looks to be a save point, but the seal and marking is different. When viewing it, we see another image from the first game, Lisa talking about Alessa. Heather says she knows that nurse, but she isn't sure how. We climb up a ladder and see a strange creature turning a valve. Heading into this place, we're in the alternate hospital, and it's nothing like anything else we've seen. It's almost indescribable. The walls are covered in moving worms, everything is bright red, and the floors are entirely steel grating. You can hear the engines of a hell machine everywhere you go, the screams, breathing, and cranks. It's horrific to be in here for too long, and this is exactly what I meant when I said the team took the horror up a notch. We're a far way from being frightened in the previous games, not wanting to go deeper into the fog or the dark. This isn't the implied fear anymore, it's right in your face. We've seen the face of the monster, exactly what it looks like, and we just want to get away. Heather finds a room with a mirror and a sink. Quickly, the room begins to turn as some organism begins to spread, enveloping the space and Heather herself. We find a morgue downstairs and a lock on the cremation oven. There's a graph on the door that numbers the locations of bodies. 
We can match those places up with the numbers on the stretchers and get the code for the door, which gives us access to another area of the hospital. In a locker room, we find a phone. Someone on the other side is singing happy birthday to Heather. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear. Oh, I forgot your name. Who are you? Oh, okay, thanks. Happy birthday, dear, who are you? It's not Leonard or Stanley, and we're really not sure who this is. He says it's Heather's 31st and also 24th birthday, but this doesn't make sense because it's not Heather's birthday and she's only 17. The man says he has a present for us. Downstairs, we find a door that has happy first birthday written beside it. Inside, we'll get some extra items, and this will change based on certain point structures throughout the game. Basically, it's based on whether you used more ammo or health items throughout the game, whether you give pain or receive it. We find a bucket full of blood and fill a bag with it. There's a memo on the ground, someone who is a holy knight of God smiting the unrighteous. Heather finds an altar deep in the hospital. We drain the blood from the bag onto the altar, and it leads behind us, a ladder and a hole suddenly appearing. Climbing down it, we're on our third boss battle, Leonard. This is the man that we talked to on the phone, Claudia's father. He looks more like creature than man and swims around us in the water. He doesn't want to give Heather the seal suddenly because he believes it's his duty to protect it. We need to shoot him repeatedly and avoid his attacks. He's pretty quick when underwater, but thankfully, very slow when above. When he dies, we're back in the normal hospital and Heather finds the seal of Metatron on the ground. If you watched my first video on these games, you'll remember this as the seal that Alessa was using to try and stop the ritual. As we exit the hospital, we see a cutscene of Vincent and Claudia arguing over theology back in the hotel. And I want to find my happiness while I'm still here. You hated your father, didn't you? I saw the way he hit you. He kicked you and made you cry. The memory of his cruelty is forever burned into my mind. Yes, yes, and that's why we need God. She is completely indoctrinated at this point, and Vincent seems to be trying to pull her out of this. Heather makes it back to the motel, and Vincent is alone inside. Douglas left a message for her. The church is on the other side of the lake. Church? I wonder what he meant by that. You don't understand? That's where Claudia is. Across the lake. On the north side. Heather leaves and heads towards the amusement park on Nathan Avenue. We're walking the same path that James used to get to the historical society in Silent Hill 2. Luckily, we don't have to walk as far and we show up at the gates of the amusement park. When Heather gets there, she feels great pain in her stomach and falls to the ground. We're now exactly where we were in the dream sequence, but things will be different this time. Now we can find the roller coaster room key and turn the thing off before we head on the tracks. The cart still turns itself on though when we're walking and Heather jumps off just in time. We see Douglas and Claudia talking in a cutscene. What is it now? You lied to me about Heather, lady. I don't like being used. Lie? What lie? That Heather was kidnapped from you. But it's true. She was originally one of us. That man, Harry Mason, stole her away and kept her hidden from us. Yeah, but she says she was happy. She was brainwashed by him, deceived, because her true self had not yet awoken. 
Claudia believes Heather was brainwashed by Harry, and that she carries God within her, just like Alessa did. She will usher in the eternal paradise. What kind of place is that? A place with no pain, no hunger, no sickness, no old age. There will be no greed or war, and all will live by God's grace alone. No this, no that, no nothing. A paradise for castrated sheep, maybe. Sounds pretty boring. Douglas raises his gun at her, and the scene cuts away. Heather ends up at the Borley Haunted Mansion. An announcer is heard, narrating our experience. We see some scary sights, blood on the walls and bodies falling from the ceiling, but nothing could live up to the horrors that we witnessed in the hospital. Heather almost gets trapped in some spikes falling from the ceiling. She heads into a hallway and a red glow appears that will kill us if we touch it. Running from it can be kind of difficult, but we just have to be quick. Heather makes it outside and finds a gate that isn't locked, but won't open. We tie it to a carousel with a chain and start it, opening the door. On the other side, we find Douglas, wounded, assumingly from his fight with Claudia. Douglas tells Heather that they have to stop the birth of the god. You, you remind me of my son. You said... Nobody was going to cry for you. Dead people don't cry. Stupid kid got himself shot robbing his bank. But why? Maybe because his pop was a penniless good for nothing. Who knows? Anyway, now I guess I'll never find. We get a little more insight into Douglas himself here. Heather says she'll finish this and come back for Douglas when it's over. What are you doing? Maybe killing you here is the only way to end this nightmare. Yeah, you might be right. Inside a fortune house, we find Douglas's notebook, a memo noting the facts of the case when he got the job to find Heather. We find two statues, one of Snow White and one of Cinderella. Pictures on the ground show their shadows, slightly different than they are now. We find a red shoe to place by Cinderella and a doll head to place in Snow White's hand. Journeying deeper into the park, we find a note that Harry took when he was here during the events of the first game. Heather finds a carousel and one of the horses is dead, a note pinned to its head with a stake. The note tells us that if the carousel goes around too many times, we'll die, and the only way to stop it is the twelfth death. We have to go around and slash at each of the horses until they stop moving. The carousel starts again, and something appears from the shadows, a demonic girl that looks just like Heather. This is Alessa, or rather, the memory of her. This fight has four phases. In the first, Alessa will use a knife. She has pretty good blocking skills though, so we have to dodge her attacks until we find an opening. This is pretty much true for every phase of the fight. During the two phases where she uses a gun, she only shoots at us if we're at a distance, so staying close and dodging her melee attacks is the best bet. The katana was the best weapon here, as trying to stay distanced just doesn't work as well as being up close. The carousel stops after Alessa is downed, and there's a note from Alessa on the ground. She talks about wanting to not continue on, and just end things when the dark god was inside her. Heather notes here that Alessa is her, they are one and the same. Stepping off the carousel, we enter the church, and notes are scrawled on the walls of the hallway. They are prayers written to the Order's Dark God. As we enter the main room of the church, Claudia is standing at the altar. How did you get here? It was Vincent, wasn't it? He led you here. 
when will he cease his meddling? But it's just as well. Hearing you here also serves my purposes. Checkmate. Claudia thinks that Alessa has finally awoken inside of Heather and that she's remembered her true self. She tries to convince Claudia that they don't need to bring paradise, but she doesn't agree. Claudia cannot be swayed. She is staunch in her beliefs and opinions. She truly believes that what she is doing is good, that they will remake the world and give mankind salvation. Alessa groans in pain again, and Claudia says that Heather's hatred is good as she walks away. Inside the chapel, we can find the Order's story of creation shown across six paintings. Heather finds a woman in the confession booth, making a confession to the death of a girl and ruining her daughter's life. Deliver me not to hell, but to purgatory. Allow me to atone for my sins there. I'll stand within the very flames of redemption no matter how they burn me. Forgive me for my wicked act of revenge. We can choose to forgive the woman or say nothing here, which will affect which ending we can get on repeat playthroughs. There are only three endings to Silent Hill 3, and during the first playthrough, we can only get one ending, so this doesn't really matter here. We find a map in the church drawn by a child, but it only shows a small bit of the building. Heather will expand it as she moves throughout the place. The church will be our last area and is easily the most terrifying and horrific place in the whole series. It truly feels like a realistic depiction of hell. If Silent Hill 2 was a personal hell, a punishment for sins, then Silent Hill 3 is the general hell, the grand archetypal idea represented in religious texts. We find a memo in one of the church's rooms that tells us about the save point symbol that we've been seeing. It's a symbol of rebirth and cycles. I really love this because it's an actual in-world saving system. When we die, we're actually reliving the moment. It's not just a game over that we never lived. Heather went through it with us. Heather finds a room with a large save point in the center and three paintings around the room, St. Alessa Gillespie, St. Jennifer Carroll, and St. Nicholas. When Heather sees the picture of Alessa, she notes that it's her, the woman and the child, at the same time. We find a library, a book talking about the history of tarot and the lost cards. Our goal in the church is to find five different cards and use them to solve the final puzzle. There's another book that tells of the warped religion of the Order and how it's changed over the years. We find a tarot card on the desk, and Vincent shows up. Heather still thinks Vincent is on Claudia's side, but it's pretty clear that Vincent wants to help, at least in some way. It's true. We believe in the same God. But I'm quite sane. So why did you help me out then? Was that also part of trying to resurrect God? It's not uncommon for people to worship the same God and still disagree. God? Are you sure you don't mean devil? Whichever you like. He tells Heather that she's the only one who can stop Claudia. You're the worst person in this room. You come here and enjoy spilling their blood. And and listening to them cry out. You feel excited when you step on them and snuff out their lives. Are you talking about the monsters? Monsters? They look like monsters to you? <gasps> oh no. Don't worry. It's just a joke. Vincent makes an interesting comment here about the monsters, introducing doubt into our minds. Are the monsters real people, or was he really just joking? We're not even sure at this point. Vincent says they'll be fine as long as they have the seal of Metatron. He gives Heather a book on other world laws and leaves. 
It tells us about the seal of Metatron. It takes a high burden on the caster and is difficult to use. Heather heads deeper into the church, finding Harry's diary in its depths. Harry was conflicted with the fact that Heather was a reincarnation of Alessa. He doesn't care about that though, and only knows that he loves her. In hindsight, they've really made Harry a flawed character. He wasn't this amazing person who took this child in and just moved on. He had doubts and fears. He worried about what it meant. But I think at a certain point that this worry went away and he only had love for Heather. We see the creature from before again, the one that was turning the valve in the hospital. It's the same shot from the intro of the game. Heather finds a book on a Glaufidus inside a sick room that resembles Alessa's from the first game. Heather sees Alessa's desk, or rather, her own desk, from the first game, and there's a note from the teacher, Kay Gordon, who you'll remember had a key named after him in Silent Hill. We find Claudia's room and a cassette tape that we can listen to. It's Vincent interviewing a woman from the Order. The woman confesses that Claudia scares her and that she's found Alessa. Some memos on the desk tell us that Vincent was rumored to be using the Order's money for his personal gain. Claudia's diary on the bed has her writing and reflecting on whether she'll be strong enough to resurrect the Dark God. There's a birthday card from Alessa to Claudia here as well. We have our five tarot cards, and we can now complete the final puzzle to unlock a door inside of Alessa's room. This is the same room and door that we used at the end of Silent Hill. The sketchbook on the bed has a riddle that will give us clues to the location of each of the cards in the door. The fool is looking at the night eye, the priestess is looking at the moon, and the hanged man is alone underground. Heading through the door, we'll see Vincent and Claudia talking in the ritual chamber. Vincent says that everything around them is the same as Alessa's personal nightmare. Claudia tells Vincent to go home, and Heather shows up. Well, the guest of honor has arrived. Let's get this party started. Heather, go ahead and kill this crazy bitch. This demon who claims to speak for God. The time has come. You can kill her now. You go to hell! <laughs> Vincent tells Heather to use the seal, but it doesn't do anything. The seal of Metatron? Now your stupid dream is over! Oh, that's just a piece of junk. What do you think you can do with that? Do you really think it can kill God? I'm sorry to see you fell for my father's foolishness. What? You're pathetic. <laughs> Claudia stabs Vincent again, finally killing him. Alessa begins to turn, her skin changing to a light shade of red. She seems to resist the birth for a moment, and we're given control. We have to use the pendant that Harry gave Heather. We've had it on us since the beginning of the game. Heather opens it, and inside is a red gem. She eats it and vomits the god out of her. Heather is about to stomp on the thing when Claudia pushes her out of the way and eats the god herself. It starts taking her over as she plans to give birth to it.
It's up to us to stop this, and Heather jumps down to finish it. It stands tall above us, a skeleton body and a large head. It will cast fire at us in a circle. This fight is mechanically much more interesting than most of the others have been so far. We actually have to avoid attacks here and watch different things. If we stand behind the circle where the fire starts, we can shoot at the god from afar. Avoiding the flames and getting as many shots off as we can is key. Eventually, she is destroyed and Heather collapses. She cries out for Harry. Even though Heather got her revenge, it doesn't matter. Her father is still dead. The circle of revenge doesn't end, and even though she's gotten what she wanted, she now has to grieve. We see Heather look back as she walks away and the scene cuts to black. Back in the amusement park, Heather finds Douglas on the bench. still alive. Heather, what the? What? Heather, what? Oh. <laughs> oh. Just a joke. Oh. You don't have to call me that. I'm not hiding anymore. You want me to use your real name? What was it again? Cheryl. The name my father gave me. This ending to the game is the canon one, as we'll see reference to one of the characters in a later game. The possessed ending can only be obtained after beating the game and gaining a certain number of points. Points can be obtained by taking damage, killing enemies, and forgiving the woman in the confession booth. In this ending, we see Heather standing over Douglas's body after killing him with the knife. The final ending, the game's UFO ending, can only be obtained after getting the Heather Beam. This weapon can only be received once you've killed 333 enemies. You have to kill 33 enemies with the Heather Beam before reaching the Daisy Villa apartments and the ending will appear. Heather returns to find Harry is alive, sitting with an alien and James hiding behind a curtain. She tells them what happened to her and Harry says he's gonna bust some heads in Silent Hill. The aliens destroy the town and the credits roll. I was pretty disappointed with the lack of endings in this entry. I do think it was made up for with the amount of unlockables in the game, which were pretty fun. I would assume this has to do with the production of the game and how much time was wasted in the beginning changing courses. If we deliver the killing blow on the boss of the game with a melee weapon, we'll be able to get the unlimited submachine gun. The Beam Saber is unlocked after killing more enemies with melee than ranged, and the Flamethrower is unlocked after killing more enemies with ranged than melee. We can get a gold pipe in our second playthrough by tossing your steel pipe in the water, and we already talked about the Heather Beam. Beating the game on hard action level will actually allow us to have a stamina and health bar. So what really happened in Silent Hill 3? Well, this one isn't as nebulous as the previous entry in the series. There is a real story here, so let's get into it. After the events of Silent Hill, Harry took Heather away to Portland where she was raised with Harry as her father. She went by the name Heather instead of her true name, Cheryl. Claudia Wolfe was indoctrinated into the church early and raised alongside Alessa. 17 years pass and she wants to retrieve the paradise that was lost to the Order when the ritual was interrupted in Silent Hill. 
To do this, she has to find Heather, who is the reincarnation of Alessa herself. Because of this, she has the god inside of her, just as Alessa did. Claudia tries to awaken this god, which is fueled by hatred, fear, and distress. This is why we see Claudia taunting Heather throughout the game, and even the reason for killing Harry in the first place. Vincent has been involved in the Order and profiting off of the church for a long time. He doesn't want paradise on earth because that means he will lose his earthly pleasures. He plans to kill Heather, which will disrupt Claudia's plans, but then he realizes he can use her to stop Claudia once and for all. Heather ends up battling her memories of Alessa, the ones that were born inside of her. This manifestation wants to kill Heather because she doesn't want to see her go through the same strife that she did. Heather almost stops the ritual to resurrect the god inside of her by using the pendant that Harry gave her. Inside is a small amount of a glaufidus, which we know drives out evil in a person. Claudia takes the god inside of herself, and Heather does battle with it, winning for good and going back to save Douglas, accepting her true name in the process. Originally, when Heather looks back at the god after killing it, there was planned to be a baby's cry heard in the distance, signifying the god being birthed again in someone new. The sound was removed from the game though, but Masahiro Ito has stated that his canon is that the god was birthed in someone new. The story for this game is fantastic, and I think the characters are written perfectly. Silent Hill 3 definitely takes more of a page out of Silent Hill 1's handbooks than 2's, but I don't see that as an issue. They were trying to do something new here, continue the story from the first game and give it a completely new spin. They didn't want to retread the story they just told, they wanted to tie up loose ends and also provide a terrifying experience at the same time. Vincent in particular is an incredibly interesting character. We're never clear if he's working against or with us. This isn't exactly new for the Silent Hill series, but Vincent is very open about it. He's intended to seem like an antagonist, and even Heather thinks he is one, but he ends up helping us later in the game, albeit for his own purposes. He also has incredible writing. He's easy to identify with because he's playing against Claudia. He also has very interesting motivations for the things he does. He enjoys the physical world and doesn't want to leave it, but he also has faith in the same god that Claudia worships. There are so many callbacks and similarities between the first game and the third. The dream sequence in the beginning mirroring Harry's dream, the shopping center television with Cheryl's image, ending in Alessa's room, battling a birthed dark god as a final boss, a split head first boss, the list goes on and on. This is perfect because it mirrors the theme of the game which is rebirth, not only in Alessa, but in Heather herself after the game ends. She is birthed anew into her true self. The irony here is that Claudia has been begging Heather to awaken her true self for the entire game, and Heather does this at the end. Claudia isn't alive to see this, but this true self is Cheryl, not Alessa. There's also so many hints throughout the game as to who Heather truly is, but Team Silent uses their classic unknowing protagonists to help us identify and only catch these things on replays, like the phone call Heather receives in the hospital. The caller says that she is 31, which would be Alessa's age if she were still alive. He then says that she is 24, which would have been Cheryl Mason's age, and then finally her first birthday is written on the wall later, signifying she is to become someone else. Silent Hill 3 is a fantastic follow-up to the first Silent Hill game, not only in story but in style. This game is easily the most terrifying in the series. It does away with the undertoned psychological horror of the second entry and decides to go full force, violent, loud, and catastrophic in your face. The second game is fantastic, don't get me wrong, it's easily the best in the series, but it doesn't even come close to how terrifying the imagery, sound, and horror in this game is. On top of that, everything has been polished to perfection. The game plays incredibly well and the combat is interesting and complex. 
It's incredibly easy to look at this game and wonder how it even came out in 2003. It looks fantastic, it feels amazing, and it shakes me to my core. If you're looking for a terrifying game and you haven't played Silent Hill 3, then this is the one. Because nothing even comes close to mirroring a realistic portrayal of an actual hell world. Silent Hill 3 did well critically. Reviewers praised the horror aspects, but harped on the lack of gameplay innovation in the series thus far. The game sold over 300,000 copies in six months, and it topped the sales charts in Japan. During the same time Silent Hill 3 was being made, Konami was already working on another entry alongside of it, Silent Hill 4. But we'll talk about that next time. Bye, Dad.